The shrill ringing of the phone pierced the quiet of my living room. I glanced at the clock, 9 p.m. on a Thursday, an unusual time for a call. A knot of unease twisted in my gut as I reached for the receiver. Hello? Marlene? The tremulous voice on the other end was my daughter-in-law, Jolene. She sounded distraught, words tumbling out between sobs. I, I've done something too terrible. I can't keep lying anymore. My heart plummeted. Jolene, slow down, dear, what's wrong? A shuddering breath. It's about Elliot. I felt the blood drain from my face at the mention of my wayward son's name. Elliot and I hadn't spoken in nearly five years, not since that awful blowout after his reckless gambling pursuits came to light. He's not, hurt is he? I gripped the phone tighter, bracing myself. No, no, he's fine, physically at least. Jolene's hitched breathing slowly calmed, but I've been sending him money, a lot of money, under false pretenses. I blinked in stunned silence, my mind whirling to process her words. You've... what? How much? Why? Four thousand dollars, she whispered, the words like a lead weight. Every month for the past year. I nearly dropped the phone, my knees buckling as the numbers hit me. Forty-eight thousand dollars, an unfathomable sum, especially for Jolene's modest income as a nurse. He called me out of the blue, Jolene continued in a rush, claimed he was in a bad accident, paralyzed and needing expensive rehab, begged me not to tell you or Ron, said you'd be too ashamed. Lies. All lies, undoubtedly, crafted by my deceitful son to prey on his brother's kind wife. My heart clenched with a sickening mixture of rage, disappointment, and gut-wrenching pity for poor Jolene, manipulated by Elliot's fictions. Oh, honey. I sank onto the couch, cradling the phone. Why didn't you say something sooner? A bitter chuckle floated through the line. Stubbornness. Pride. I didn't want you all to know what a fool I'd been, but I can't keep covering for him anymore, not after draining my savings completely. Her voice trailed off, and I could hear the defeat, the despair. More than anything, I felt the overwhelming need to piece together exactly what Elliot had done. Jolene, listen to me. I kept my tone firm yet comforting. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Just tell me everything you know from the beginning. Don't leave anything out. There was a pregnant pause, then a resolute sigh. Okay, it all started with a phone call about 15 months ago. As Jolene haltingly recounted Elliot's elaborate web of deception... I clutched the phone with whitened knuckles, wisps of anger uncurling inside me. My son, my own flesh and blood, had once again succumbed to his worst impulses, wreaking havoc with his lies. This time, however, he had gone too far. This time, I would make sure he faced the consequences of his actions. No more running. No more enabling. This time, the karma he deserved awaited. After that harrowing call with Jolene, I barely slept a wink. My mind was awash with tumultuous thoughts and recriminations about my son's appalling actions. How could Elliot have sunk so low? And how did we not see the truth sooner? The next morning, I phoned Jolene, my voice gritty with exhaustion and simmering anger. We need to get to the bottom of this whole sordid mess, right now. She agreed without hesitation. Within the hour, she was at my doorstep looking as ragged as I felt. Her eyes were swollen and rimmed with dark circles— a testament to her own anguished night. "'Thank you for coming over,' I said, enveloping her in a fierce hug. Jolene sagged against me, drawing a ragged breath. "'I'm so sorry, Marlene. I should have told you sooner about Elliot's lies.' I pulled back, fixing her with a determined look. "'No more apologies. We're going to get to the truth and make him pay for what he's done.' Jolene nodded, fresh resolve hardening her features. "'Where do we start?' I outlined a plan, contacting hospitals and medical facilities to verify Elliot's claims, tracking his movements through credit card statements and phone records. Jolene added her own idea, reaching out to his old friends to dig up any other deceits. We spent the next few days in a whirlwind of phone calls, emails, and in-person visits. With every inquiry, Elliot's tangled fabrications started to unravel at the seams. There was no record of any accident no admission to the rehab facility he named. The phone numbers and addresses he provided led to dead ends. Jolene managed to track down two of Elliot's ex-buddies from his gambling days, guys he used to pal around with at those seedy underground clubs. Their response was chilling. Elliot? Yeah, he's still running his same old scams, hustling people for cash, one sneered. Dude's been blacklisted from every reputable casino in three states for his con games. The other snorted derisively. 
Trust me, if you gave that lowlife a dime, you got played. Hard. With each new revelation, my heart twisted with a sickening combination of anger, sorrow, and bitter disappointment. The scope of Elliot's lies seemed to stretch endlessly. How could my own child harbor such darkness, such blatant disregard for those who loved him most? To make matters worse, the financial toll of his duplicity came into sharp focus as Jolene and I pored over her drained accounts, listing out medical bills that didn't exist, payments made to ghost representatives, and phantom caregivers. Nearly fifty thousand dollars, gone in an intricate ruse spun by my own son. That night I sat in my darkened living room, the weight of Elliot's betrayal crushing down on me like a vice. Jolene had finally crashed on the sofa, spent from our emotional roller coaster. With trembling hands I dialed a number I never expected to call, that of Jack Hartley, a gruff ex-cop I knew from my teaching days. A man with shady connections, but an uncompromising sense of justice. Jackie, I spoke in a hushed tone as the line picked up. I need your help with something. A family matter that's gone criminal. There was a momentary pause, then his gravelly response. Tell me everything. As I quietly laid out the sordid details for Jack, the first glimmerings of a risky plan began taking shape in my mind. We would confront Elliot soon, but this time there would be no more running. No more deception. This time he would face the consequences. Jolene sat across from me at the kitchen table, absently stirring her coffee while I outlined my plan to Jack over the phone. Her eyes were hollow, the normally vibrant hazel now dull with fatigue and heartbreak. Seeing her like this fueled my own fury toward Elliot. So that's the situation, I finished, keeping my voice low and steady. We need to draw him out, get him to confess everything on record. A contemplative grunt came through the line. Risky move. Going vigilante like this, Marley, you sure you two can pull it off without him catching wind? I shot Jolene a pointed look, and she straightened, mouth setting in a grim line. We don't have a choice, Jackie. The law's been unable to touch Elliot so far. This is our only chance at real justice. All right, then, Jack sighed. I'll make a couple calls, set some things up on my end. You just focus on getting that snake to strike. We will, I assured him. Thank you for everything. Don't thank me yet, he replied gruffly before disconnecting. I slowly set down the phone, letting the weight of our planned sting wash over me. Reaching across the table, I clasped Jolene's hand. You up for this? I won't lie, it could get ugly when we confront him. She squeezed my fingers with surprising strength. I want him to face what he's done, no matter how hard it gets. He, he took everything from me with his lies. Her voice thickened with feeling. I can't let that stand. Nodding firmly, I began outlining my strategy to lure Elliot out of hiding. We're going to tell him there's a family emergency, make him think one of us is in the hospital, lay on the sympathy and let his guilt do the rest. Jolene's brow furrowed. You really think he'd fall for that? After everything? He will if we pitch it right, I stated with certainty. I know how Elliot operates. He craves validation, needs to be seen as the doting son coming through in a crisis, that needy ego of his will get the best of him. A flicker of dark amusement crossed her face. So we just have to keep feeding his delusions for a little longer. Precisely. I watched understanding bloom in her eyes, chasing away the shadows. Then when he shows up, playing the hero like always, that's when we slam the truth back in his face. Jolene's lips curved into a cold smile. Let him lie one more time. I can be very convincing when I need to be. An answering grin spread across my own features at her steely resolve. In that moment, I felt a sense of grim purpose settle over me, banishing any lingering doubts. My son's karmic retribution was finally at hand. Over the next few days, we choreographed our roles meticulously. I would initiate the first call to Elliot, voice cracking with panic as I told him Jolene had been in a terrible accident. Jolene would then take over, frantically urging him to come quick weaving plausible yet vague details about her condition. We factored in his predictable responses, the hollow promises to be there soon, the self-centered remarks about coming to save the day. Once he fell for the ruse and agreed to meet us, Jack's crew would be lying in wait. Finally, the night before our sting was set in motion, Jolene and I went over every beat of the plan one final time. There could be no margin for error if we wanted to ensure Elliot's apprehension. As I toweled off from my shower later, 
I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the streaked mirror. My jaw was set in a hard line, eyes glinting with resolve. It was a look I hadn't seen in years, not since my final showdown with Elliot before he cut ties. This time would be different, though. This time, I wouldn't be blinded by misplaced maternal hopes and rose-tinted memories. I knew who my son had become, a remorseless con man without a shred of decency. And this time, I was prepared to go to the mat to finally firmly shut down his wretched charade once and for all. The next few days were a whirlwind of planning and preparation. In addition to Jack's undercover support, Jolene and I decided to gather our own arsenal of evidence against Elliot. The more ammunition we had, the less wriggle room he'd have to talk his way out of this one. I started by reaching back out to those old gambling buddies Jolene had tracked down. Greasing a few palms loosened their tongues considerably. Elliot's been working a real slick hustle these past couple years, one of them divulged over beers at a dingy pub, using fake IDs to run cash loans and sports bets across the tri-state area. The other snickered darkly. Dude's got a whole network of loan sharks and bookies eating out of his hand with his con artist BS. They have no idea who they're really dealing with. Sickened but unsurprised, I pressed for more details on Elliot's likely whereabouts and patterns. Information was power after all. By the end of our shady meetup, I had pages of notes detailing Elliot's shadowy debt trail and possible hideouts. Meanwhile, Jolene took a more personal tack, reconnecting with Elliot's ex-girlfriend, Trina, who he'd relentlessly used and discarded years ago. Though initially hesitant, Trina soon warming to dishing all the dirt once she learned of Elliot's latest misdeeds. That pathological liar tried to convince me he was some big-shot finance investor, she vented, voice dripping venom one night over the phone, had me totally snowed about his business dealings until I caught him in bed with my roommate. Jolene's lip curled in disgust. Sounds exactly like the kind of mind games Elliot loves to play. Oh, it gets better, Trina said with mirthless laugh. When I finally kicked that sociopath out, I found storage containers full of fake documents and IDs he'd been using to drain funds across multiple bank accounts. Anything you can send over as proof? Jolene's voice was clipped, but calm, as she took meticulous notes. By the time we reconvened, we had a disturbingly thick dossier cataloging lie after lie, scam after scam my son had perpetrated over the years. Fake investments, fraudulent benefit claims, shady gambling rackets, the list went on and on, each entry making my heart ache more. How had such a bright, loving little boy turned into such a reprehensible man? Where had I failed so catastrophically as his mother? Jolene seemed to sense my spiraling doubts as we poured over the damning evidence. Gripping my hand firmly, she locked eyes with me. We can't start going down the road of self-blame again, not after coming this far. I squeezed back, grounding myself. You're right. No more second-guessing or justifications. Her jaw set in a hard line. We do this for all the innocent people he's taken advantage of and manipulated over the years. He needs to be held accountable, no matter how hard it'll be to finally face the truth about him. Hearing the realism in her voice fortified my own strengthening resolve. For too long, I'd clung to the false hope that my son, my clever, mischievous Elliot, would one day see the error of his ways and come back to me a changed man. That luminous little boy was long gone, though, consumed by the darkness of his own cravings and moral apathy. The man he'd become— was a remorseless monster, leaving a wake of shattered trust and stolen livelihoods everywhere he went. And as painful as it was to admit, he was no longer the son deserving of a mother's unconditional love and devotion. Which is why, when the burner phone Jack had provided began ringing as the sting operation loomed, I answered with ice in my veins. Hello? A smooth, vaguely familiar male voice. Marlene speaking, I replied evenly. Is everything ready on your end? There was a beat of silence, then a hushed response. The crew is locked and ready to move on your signal. We've got eyes on the mark's current location and Lojack on his car. I exhaled slowly, feeling Jolene's reassuring presence beside me. Good. We'll keep you posted once we get confirmation on his movements. Understood, the voice replied crisply. Don't take any unnecessary risks. I ended the call without responding suddenly impatient to have this entire sordid affair concluded once and for all. Turning to Jolene, 
I saw my own grim determination reflected in her eyes. It's time, I said simply. Let's finish this. The air was thick with tension as Jolene and I went over the plan one final time. We were like two generals strategizing before a pivotal battle, weighing contingencies, steeling our nerves against any possibility of failure. Remember, as soon as Elliot arrives, we have to really sell the hospital act, I reminded her, keeping my voice low and insistent. He has to fully believe there's been some sort of emergency to get him through the door. Jolene nodded tightly, hands fisting at her sides. There was a flinty glint in her hazel eyes I hadn't seen before, a hardness born from the cruel revelations of Elliot's betrayal. Don't worry, I'll be utterly convincing, she said grimly. After all the lies and anguish he's put me through, being a good actress is the least of my concerns. I felt a pang in my chest at her bitterness but pressed on. Once he's inside and we have him contained, that's when we'll start laying out the evidence. Every money trail, fake statement, illegal transaction, the works. He's going to panic, lash out, maybe even try to bolt. Jolene's pragmatic assessment wasn't lost on me. We both knew how volatile and manipulative Elliot could be when cornered. That's why we'll be ready, I stated with steely conviction. A fleeting image of Jack's stone-faced subordinates flickered through my mind geared up and awaiting my call. If he tries anything, they'll be there to shut it down. No more games, no more running. Jolene's laugh was brittle but laced with satisfaction. Good. I want to see the arrogance drain from his face when he realizes there's no more lying his way out of this. I thought of the hundreds of documents we'd compiled, irrefutable proof of Elliot's litany of confidence tricks and outright thefts. The hard evidence was overwhelming, compounded by the sheer audacity of scamming his own family. Still, a tiny ember of stubborn optimism burned within me, that misguided maternal instinct that naively hoped for redemption, for my son to finally come to his senses. To show some semblance of remorse and humanity in the face of his extensive crimes, but one look at Jolene's haunted, drained expression snuffed out that faint glimmer. She was the one who had borne the brunt of Elliot's cruelty, violated repeatedly by his casual lies and callous greed. There could be no more infinite second chances after such a profound breach of trust. As if reading my mind, she exhaled a shuddering breath. I know this is your son we're talking about, your own flesh and blood, but you have to be prepared for the fact that Elliot, he might really be gone for good this time. I felt my throat tighten but gave a small nod of acceptance. I know. Believe me, I've had plenty of sleepless nights reckoning with that possibility. Jolene's gaze was probing but sympathetic. Have you thought about what you'll say to him once we have him trapped in his lies? A dozen rehearsed scenarios flickered through my brain. The furious scoldings, emotional pleas, bitter condemnations. I had imagined every possible confrontation ad nauseum this past week. But none of those anguished parental reactions seemed quite right not with the gravity of Elliot's stunning disregard for human decency. The truth is, I don't know if I'll be able to say anything, I admitted quietly, surprising myself with the admission. Part of me fears that if I open my mouth, I'll just start lashing out at him in blind rage, or worse, break down completely. Reaching across, Jolene squeezed my hand in a grounding gesture. Then maybe, maybe it's better if you let the evidence do the talking— show him just how thoroughly he miscalculated this time around. I mulled over her pragmatic suggestion, feeling the leaden weight of responsibility pressing down. This wasn't just about laying a trap for some common criminal. This was my own progeny we were preparing to confront and condemn. Could I truly remain stoically unmoved as his tangled skein of falsehoods completely unraveled before us? Or would the sight of my once sweet, silly boy's unrepentant unraveling shatter my resolve completely? Lost in my turbulent thoughts, I barely registered Jolene rising to prepare for the evening ahead. It wasn't until she placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder that I glanced up, blinking back to the present moment. It's going to be okay, Marlene, she said, conviction ringing in every syllable. One way or another, we'll make sure justice gets served. The karma Elliot escaped for so long— it's finally catching up to him now. I felt a grim sort of peace settle over me at her words. She was right. Fate had merely been biding its time all these years, 
letting Elliot blindly dig himself into an increasingly deep pit of lies and exploitation. And come tomorrow evening, we would be there to ensure that same cruel universe yanked him down into the depths once and for all, facing the ugly consequences he deserved. Exhaling a steadying breath, I rose and gave Jolene's hand one final resolute squeeze. Let's get ready. It's judgment time. The heavy silence was shattered by the shrill ringing of the doorbell. Jolene and I exchanged one final, grim look before she moved to answer it. Showtime. E. Elliot. She opened the door, voice trembling with feigned distress. Oh, thank God you're here. Where is she? What happened? My son's voice sliced through the tension, smooth and assured as ever. The familiar cadence of manipulation made my blood boil. I steeled myself as heavy footsteps approached the living room. Elliot swept in like a conquering hero, expression twisted into one of faux concern. Mom? You said Jolene was hurt, that there was an axide. His eyes landed on me, then flicked over to Jolene, hovering uncertainly by the entryway. The facade slipped for just a moment as confusion creased his features. Seizing the opportunity, I rose to my feet with purpose. There was no accident, Elliot. But there certainly is an emergency. The fact that you've been deceiving and stealing from this family for over a year now. His brow furrowed in a well-practiced mask of indignation. What? That's absolutely ridiculous. I haven't. Save it. Jolene cut him off, anger flashing in her eyes as she crossed her arms defensively. We know everything about the lies, Elliot. The fake medical bills, the bogus rehabilitation centers, all of it just an elaborate con to leech money out of me. For a fraction of a second, raw panic flickered across his face before the arrogant smirk resurfaced. You're both overreacting. This is all just a misunderstanding, really. Is it? I challenged, keeping my tone gelid despite the fury brewing inside me. Because we have evidence of every single transaction, every fake document and phony account you've been using over the past fifteen months to perpetrate this fraud. Moving numbly, I gestured to the thick dossier of compiled records sitting on the coffee table. Bank statements, payment receipts, phone logs, a literal paper trail of each and every one of your egregious lies, Elliot. As his gaze landed on the damning pile of proof, the color visibly drained from his cheeks. The unflappable conman mask had finally splintered, revealing what I'd always known festered beneath, a sniveling coward utterly incapable of accepting responsibility. You, you don't understand. I needed that money. I was in a bad place. We understand plenty, you pathetic snake, Jolene snarled, taking an aggressive step forward as months of anguish contorted her features. We know all about your outstanding gambling debts, your illegal bookmaking, your shady false identities to keep scamming more funds. Elliot's eyes went wide with panic, head whipping around like a cornered animal as the walls closed in around him. How? Your sleazy little gambling crew buddies ratted you out after I leaned on them, I stated coolly, as did that ex-girlfriend Trina you used to swindle on the side. Jolene's laugh was caustic. For such a skilled liar, you really didn't cover your tracks well at all, did you? And those are just the highlights of your pathetic criminal resume, I pressed on relentlessly. We have detailed financial records of funds you pilfered through fake investment scams, fraudulent Medicare claims, you name it. A damning, decade-long pattern of exploitation and deception. Elliot seemed to deflate before our very eyes, the sneering bravado melting away as he registered the sheer depth of exposure we'd uncovered. His mouth worked uselessly, desperately searching for an angle, a convenient lie to wriggle free. But there were no more deceptions that could dig him out this time. We'd ripped away every mask, every layer of artifice to reveal him for the wretched, immoral con man he truly was. No, you can't do this. His voice was little more than a broken whisper now, the wounded bravado of a child realizing their games had gone much too far. I'm your son? White-hot rage lanced through me at his utterly pathetic attempt to salvage sympathy. You lost any right to call yourself that years ago, I said in a tone of arctic finality. Jolene stepped up beside me, her own expression unforgiving. We've given you more than enough chances to show even an ounce of human decency and remorse over the years, Elliot, but you've proven you're fundamentally broken inside. Her gaze was steely, uncompromising. Congratulations, the lies and betrayals have finally caught up to you. 
the only karma left is to face the legal consequences you've been evading for far too long. At her words, a flicker of resigned understanding crossed Elliot's features, as if he could finally grasp the depth of the grave he'd spent years digging himself into. But just as quickly, the hollowness in his eyes turned flinty, a cornered animal's instinct for self-preservation kicking in. You think you've got everything all figured out, don't you? His voice dropped to a smooth, oily register I recognized all too well, the last resort of a desperate con man playing his final card. Well, guess what, you smug. Whatever vile retort he was about to unleash died in his throat as a series of muffled thumps echoed from the hallway. Elliot's head whipped around just as the door burst open, three burly figures in plain clothes spilling into the living room. Don't move, Elliot Conrad, the lead man barked in a tone that brooked no argument. We have a skilled surveillance unit waiting outside with enough evidence on your scams to put you away for a very long time. Elliot gaped, mouth working soundlessly as the men efficiently secured his wrists, reading off his legal rights in clip monotone. As he was finally led away in shackles, our eyes met one last time, my own cold and utterly devoid of the conflicted love and hope I'd harbored for so long. There was only stone-faced resolution now, and the faintest whisper of tragic relief at closing this long, sordid chapter once and for all. The heavy silence that settled over the living room was deafening in the wake of Elliot's arrest. Jolene and I stood rooted in place, still trying to process the reality of what we had just orchestrated, the undoing of my own flesh and blood. It was Jolene who finally broke the stillness, her voice tinged with a mix of weariness and vindication. It's over. He's finally going to face real consequences. I could only numbly nod eyes still trained on the empty space where Elliot had been dragged away in handcuffs mere minutes ago. Somewhere in the hazy recesses of my mind, a voice whispered that I should feel remorse, guilt even over the downfall of my child. But that voice was drowned out by a rising tide of righteous anger, at Elliot's reprehensible misdeeds, at the years of enabling his wretched behavior, at the blatant disregard he showed his own family in pursuit of selfish greed. The anguish and fury won out, scorching away any lingering threads of motherly empathy. Sensing my turmoil, Jolene laid a comforting hand on my arm. You did the right thing, you know, the just thing, however painful it had to be. I swallowed hard against the lump in my throat. Did I, though? He may be an adult, but he's still my son, my own child that I, I essentially turned against. Jolene's expression was a mix of sympathy and pragmatism. You didn't turn against him, Marlene. Elliot made that choice himself a long time ago, to utterly disregard the unconditional love and second chances you gave him in favor of a life of profiting off cruelty and exploitation. Her words rang true, a sobering reminder of the maze-like trail of misery and betrayal Elliot had blazed over the past decade. The staggering paper trail of evidence littering the coffee table bore undeniable testament to the lives he'd steamrolled in pursuit of his next selfish con. You're right, I murmured, feeling a sudden lightness in the admission. I didn't turn against him. He alienated himself through his own unforgivable actions. A look of grim acceptance settled over Jolene's features. We simply did what had to be done to stop the cycle of harm. As much as it pains me to say it, Elliot left us no other choice. An unexpected pang lanced through me at her brutal candor. For all the heartache and anguish Elliot's duplicity had wrought upon this woman, I considered a daughter. She still held out an ember of futile hope that he could somehow be redeemed. That maybe our risky gambit to apprehend him might shock him into a moment of self-awareness and remorse. But as the minutes ticked by in tense silence, it became increasingly clear that we had both been chasing a childish fantasy all along. The smirking, unrepentant facade Elliot had defiantly clung to was not an act, it was the pure, rotten essence of who he'd become as a person. A callous, depraved narcissist devoid of any shred of empathy or accountability. The revelation struck me like a cordwood to the chest, finally allowing the full gravity of my son's depravity to sink in. This monster we had detained and turned over to the authorities tonight was not some pitiable wayward soul crying out for help and redemption. No, Elliot was a poison, a creeping, venomous malignancy upon those foolish enough to trust or defend him. 
and we had just lanced that toxic influence from our lives with brutal finality. You know, I began, the words feeling leaden as I gave voice to the bleak epiphany. Part of me had hoped that when we finally turned the screws on him, showed him the full extent of the lies we uncovered. Part of me hoped he might actually show some remorse, some sign of the person he used to be, deep down. Jolene's eyes were haunted but unsurprised as I pressed on. But after the way he postured and tried manipulating even at the very end, I realized the hard truth. The good, sweet little boy I remembered is gone, Jolene. Erased and twisted beyond recognition by his own selfishness and moral vacancy. A hollow chuckle escaped my lips as I bowed my head, worrying the locket around my neck, one of the few cherished mementos from Elliot's distant childhood that I still clung to. My son, in every sense of who he truly is now, is simply a monster without a shred of redeemable humanity left. Silence hung heavy between us as my words sank in, the air thick with leaden grief and hard-won acceptance of that grim reality. After several moments, Jolene reached over and gently pried the locket from my fingers, turning it over to admire the faded image within. "'He may be gone,' she said, sadness tempering her voice. "'But this little boy, the person he was meant to grow into—' She looked up at me, eyes shining. "'This is who we keep fighting for, Marlene. This is the justice and closure he deserves, even if he can't see it any more. I stared at the locket, at the pudgy, mischievous visage frozen in time on happier days, and felt something within me loosen and release. Jolene was right. The person Elliot had become was a harsh, unforgiving truth to accept. But it was not one I had to let define or corrode every happiness of years past, either. Reclaiming the locket, I clutched it close for strength. You're right. We fought for that little boy as much as ourselves this time to sever the childhood promise that got so abhorrently perverted. Jolene laid her head against my shoulder, drawing me into a comforting embrace. And there in the wreckage of duplicity's aftermath, we allowed ourselves a moment of silence, to grieve, to find solace, to let the shards of anguish transmute into resilience. Because while the sun had proved himself a lost, festering cause long ago, we would endure despite it all. For in purgating that cancerous influence from our lives once and for all, therein lay the first blossoms of redemption, to rise unbowed from the ruins Elliot left behind. In the weeks following Elliot's arrest, an odd sort of serenity descended over the household. As if in expunging that gnawing cancer of betrayal, Jolene and I had simultaneously lanced a deeper, more systemic poison from our lives. The days blurred together in a blur of legal proceedings and testimonies against my son, a crushing parade of paperwork and evidence that left no shred of doubt as to the extent of his reprehensible grifts. Not that Elliot seemed remotely remorseful about any of it. You'll regret this, he sneered at me during one tense courtroom recess, eyes glittering with malice, airing out every dirty secret of my supposed crimes for the world to see. I merely stared back, unmoved. Beside me, Jolene's hand found mine, giving a reassuring squeeze. We'd heard Elliot's recycled bravado and empty threats enough times by now to render them utterly toothless. After cycloning through so many years of emotional tumult and heartache because of him, this bizarrely clinical dismantling of his house of lies was almost anticlimactic in its banality. Almost. There was still a grim sense of finality to it all, the closing of an ugly, tangled chapter in our lives that should have ended years ago before Elliot's misdeeds could metastasize so malignantly. But at long last we were cutting out the lingering rot, cauterizing the fetid wound of his malfeasance. When Elliot was finally remanded to state custody on multiple charges—fraud, embezzlement, identity theft—the list went on and on. There were no hysterics or grandiose courtroom outbursts, just a terse sentencing statement and the churning finality of steel cuffs ratcheting into place. As he was led away in chains, Elliot's gaze found mine one final time. I searched his hooded eyes for any fleeting glimmer of contrition, the faintest sign that somewhere within that labyrinth of delusion and pathological self-interest, a kernel of the sweet little boy I'd raised still flickered but his expression remained an impenetrable mask, devoid of anything beyond contemptuous fury. And in that moment, the last vestige of misguided maternal love I'd harbored for so long finally guttered and died, 
an inevitable, cataclysmic collapse succumbing to the sheer mass of his moral iniquity. It's done, I murmured, more to myself than anyone as we vacated the courtroom. And finality laced the words, both haunting and deeply cathartic. Jolene squeezed my hand again, understanding shining in her eyes. No more placating words or assurances were needed between us. We had stared down the worst of ourselves in dismantling this family's generational trauma and emerged scarred but triumphant on the other side. In the months that followed, I took my first deep, steadying breaths of true freedom in decades. The persistent albatross of tolerating Elliot's escalating depravities over the years had finally slipped its suffocating tether, letting me spread my wings. Of course, grief still reared its head in moments of quiet stillness. I found myself staring at old photographs, tracing the outlines of my son's image with wistful longing for those halcyon days before his conscience splintered beyond repair, when the gleam of innocence had yet to calcify into flinty narcissism. I could dwell in those memories of maternal sweetness we once shared, but erecting a mausoleum to my own wistful remorse would be a disservice to the choice Elliot made to alienate himself utterly in favor of a life of unchecked duplicity and preying upon the unconditional love of those who should have mattered most. No, I would not be shackled to those what-ifs and lingering vestiges of futile hope. With time and Jolene's unwavering moral buttress, I found the resilience to recontextualize Elliot's very existence in my heart. He was not a wound to be tenderly nursed, nor a lingering trauma to stoke and relive ad nauseum. My son was now a hard-won victory over generational toxicity and self-deceit. A cautionary parable of what festering evil could consume even the most intensely loved soul, should they willingly surrender to their basest impulses without accountability. Some would call it tragic, this dissolution of the sacred mother-son bond over such squalid circumstances. But I chose to reclaim the narrative, to not let Elliot's treacheries totally define and erode the joys of earlier days. There had been light and laughter and profound love, all of which flowered anew in the aftermath of his permanent removal from our lives. And in nurturing that reclaimed inner grace, I found a path to not just surviving the devastation of betrayal, but transcending it. Jolene was my kindred spirit through that personal metamorphosis. Her own scars may have cut deeper than most, but she wore them like badges of herd-earned wisdom and perseverance now. The tremulous, haunted woman of those first anguished days rapidly receded, replaced by a rebirth of iron-willed self-assurance. She finished nursing school at the top of her class and moved into her own place, newly determined to not let Elliot's parasitism define her or dictate the trajectory of her dreams. When the hospital offered her a position in their post-op ward, I'd never seen her radiate more fulfillment and pride. In many ways, these were the first true strides into authentic adulthood for Jolene. Long unshackled of the draining toxicity in her marriage, she was finally free to spread her wings and chase the horizons of her own making without dragging the soul-crushing weight of Elliot's duplicities. And though our bond had been forged through mutual suffering at his hands, it evolved into something richer and infinitely more life-affirming in the aftermath. We were not victims united by an indifferent monster anymore. We were sisters in resilience, arcing ever upward on the ascendant trajectory of our reclaimed destiny. In those cathartic moments of breathless renewal, my eyes would inevitably stray to that old tarnished locket containing the last remnants of the sun I used to know, and rather than lapsing into wistful melancholy, I would simply gaze at the image and smile. Not with regret or sorrow, but a vibrant, forward-looking joy at putting that ghost to rest, once and for all. For the excruciating trial of Elliot's downward spiral and ultimate self-immolation was finally over. In its stead blossomed the rapturous rebirth of two souls, stalked by their traumas but ultimately indelible in spirit. Indomitable. At long last the shadow had passed, and for the first time in decades I could bask completely in the radiant promise of new beginnings.